Welcome to uh, our Frontiers in Addiction lecture series here at Torrance Memorial Hospital in the Thelma McMillan Center. We are pleased to put this on in partnership with The Meadows and Cheryl Camby, who will talk a little bit in a little bit. I'm Dr. Gelbart, the Executive Director here at the Thelma McMillan Center. And again, you're in for a real treat today. So I'm going to keep my remarks relatively short and want to get to the program soon. Uh, as I said, this is Torrance Memorial Hospital. This is our 29th year here as the Thel McMillan Center. I think I told you this last time we met, but it's something we're so proud of. And it's not just we're proud of, but the community should be proud of because you have a great place to get your health care. You know, I, Newsweek came out with their top hospitals in the United States. Torrance Memorial Hospital was the eighth best hospital in California and the number one hospital in the United States that was not a teaching hospital. That's pretty awesome. That means you can get great care here, great doctors, great programs, and you know, we're really proud of that. <clears throat> it really is quite an achievement, actually. Number one hospital in the country. Uh, so here we have a, an adult and adolescent IOP, intensive outpatient program. I think most of you know about it. If not, I, I just want to introduce some of our staff that is here. Uh, Dr. Watson, our program director, is in the back if you need to speak with him. We have a new great outreach coordinator, Whitney Stewart, who's in the back. Hopefully you'll take some time to meet her. Therese Lang is here somewhere. She's our intake specialist. Everybody who calls, uh, she makes sure the professional person uh, interfaces with them right when they call. Uh, and, you know, in general, we have a great staff. That's really what the, the, the uh, what we're most proud of in our program. We have a staff that has probably 250 plus years of experience just in our program and over 300 years of personal recovery. So it is people who have been here for 25 plus years uh, and you know that's really what makes a great program quite honestly. Uh, <clears throat> we have some new things which I've mentioned before. We have a great new trauma infused treatment track uh, with a an, incredible trauma therapist who does yoga, yoga informed, trauma informed yoga, mindfulness relapse prevention, and, uh, and trauma informed groups. So we've added another day to our program and uh, that's working out really fabulous, quite honestly. <clears throat> uh, housekeeping real quick. If you have cell phones, now would be a good time. Well, if you have cell phones. If you don't have a cell phone, raise your No. <laughs> now would be a good time to uh, turn off your cell phones. Uh, there's bathrooms in the back. There'll be a break of about 10 to 15 minutes when Dr. Pohl, you know, somewhere in the middle of his talk. And we'll hold questions till the end, and then we'll be able to come around with a microphone so everybody can hear your question. Uh, lastly, make sure you pick up our flyer for the rest of the year. We have two, two major educational programs. This is our Frontiers in Addiction lecture series, which we put on every other month. We get nationally known speakers as we have today. And our next one will be July 16th, Changing the Culture from Healthcare Provider Addiction, Burnout, and Suicide to Resiliency and Burning Brightly with Dr. Matthew Goldenberg, an excellent speaker. And then every other month we're not here, we're over at the Thel McMillan Center with more of a community-oriented specialists. And our next one will be uh, the int on June 25th, the Intimacy Gram, How to Diagram Relationships and Balance for Growth and Direction with Ken Francis of Kaiser Permanente. So with that, as I say, I'm always, I'm gonna introduce our speaker. I'm always thrilled when, you know, we, we have all great speakers, but when we have somebody who's got such prominence and, and recognition in the field, you know, it makes me feel good that wow, we were able to present this to the community, and uh, again, I'm, I'm really proud of it. So, Mel Pohl, MD, DFASAM, is certified by the American Board of Addiction Medicine and a distinguished fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. He is the Chief Medical Officer of Las Vegas Recovery Center. He co-authored Pain Recovery, How to Find Balance and Reduce Suffering from Chronic Pain, Pain Recovery for Families, how to find balance when someone else's pain becomes your problem too. A day without pain and the pain antidote. Stop suffering from chronic pain 
avoid addiction to painkillers, and reclaim your life. We, we, he, he was featured in a program about chronic pain from PBS, which aired nationally in 2016, and we couldn't have a better speaker and a more prominent topic, so please welcome Dr. Paul. Thanks for that kind introduction. How's the sound? Can you hear me in the back? Raise your hand if you can hear. Uh, you know, the very first time I gave a talk, they hooked me up to one of these microphones and I went to the bathroom. And <laughs> nobody told me that it was on. So I always check with the AV guy who had turned it off, turned it on. Uh, nobody, nobody heard, did you? No. <laughs> So the title of my talk is How We Miss the Boat. And uh, the, the subtext is that we're in the midst of an opioid epidemic. Uh, if you, I mean, I just assume that everybody in the room, if you're alive, knows about the opioid epidemic because it's on the news every day and Congress is paying attention to it finally. And, um, you know, in treatment, we are inundated with uh, people who are dependent on opioids, uh, the, the, the trend has been from prescription painkillers, of course, to heroin and now to the most lethal uh, medicine we've had in a long time, or, or drug of abuse, a fentanyl and the cogeners, the, the synthetic fentanyl. So what I really want to back up and talk about this morning is how we got here, how we got to a problem with opioids, uh, and the real core of the problem is chronic pain. And it starts with a misunderstanding about the nature of pain. So that's where I'd like to begin this morning. Um, the, uh, I'm not supposed to roam, right? They want me to be in the light. So if I, if I move out of the light, let me know. Uh, but I, so anyway, I want to be in the light. <laughs> Literally and figuratively, yes, thank you. Um, so, let's talk about pain. Um, first, tell me what, what's acute pain? Give me an example, several examples of acute pain. Appendicitis. Appendicitis. Mm -hmm. Fracture. Fracture. Good big mouth, I like that. <laughs> I mean, loud projecting. <laughs> Thank you. Toothache, surgical incision. The, the giving birth, yeah. <laughs> Certainly, yeah, we're not gonna talk about that this morning. <laughs> so, but, but really all of those things have in common the fact that there's a beginning and an end, and at the end of the cause of the pain, the tissue damage, the pain goes away. The, the bo broken bone heals, the surgical incision, maybe there's a scar, but there's no more pain if things go well. That's the nature of acute pain. The biggest misunderstanding we've made is that we think that acute pain and chronic pain are in any way related, and they're not. The only thing that acute pain and chronic pain have in common is the word pain. So let's look at some of the fallacies that we've traveled, the road that we've traveled down. And I'll tell you, how many, any physicians in the room? Okay, well, I'll try and be nice, but you know, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to be nice to us because we're at, we're at the core of this, aren't we? You know, we, the medical profession, nursing and, and physicians, uh, have misunderstood the fact that chronic pain is something to do with acute pain. So if that's true, then chronic pain should be related to tissue damage, right? So let's take a bulging disc. If I have back pain, what's the next procedure that a physician's gonna order to, to see what's going on. X-ray, MRI, CAT scan. In my case, they stood me on my head and did another MRI. Then they injected dye into the disc. Anybody had that? It's called the discogram. It's like ridiculous, torture. And if it hurts, that, that's, the, that's the cause of the pain. So we study it and we say, well, this tissue damage is responsible for this pain. Bigger tissue damage should have more pain. Smaller tissue damage, less pain. And then what do we do? Well, we go after it, right? We go after treating the tissue damage. And if it's a disc, 
We get a doc who sticks a needle into the disc with anti-inflammatory medicine like a steroid, or uh, he or she takes a, a needle and burns the nerve that's causing the pain theoretically, right? And people had experience with this? It's, I mean, it's lovely, right? And, and then, of course, what do we do to treat the pain? Yeah, we throw a blanket over the brain, pretty much. That's our medication approach to treatment. And then, worse comes to worse, none of this is working. And we go to the doc, and what does the doc say? Surgeon. Yeah, I'm going to send you to a surgeon, a specialist, who is going to evaluate the tissue damage, look at the MRI studies, and treat the tissue damage. And what percentage of people who have back surgery do you suppose have less back surgery on a sustained basis after their back surgery? Less than 20%. So it's a bad solution, but that's what we do. That's the science of, of pain treatment. And at the end of all this, you know, we've done everything that we thought was right. I mean, you know, nobody in this scenario is evil or is doing the wrong thing just because they want to make money. They think, you know, the doctor looks at the MRI and says, look, there's a bulging disc. We cut the bulge out, it'll take the pressure off the nerve. That makes sense. Well, it turns out that the pain is not related to that tissue damage. The pain is where? It's in the brain. The nerves travel up to the brain. And until and unless we pay attention to that, we never make people better. So patients come to me, you know, at Las Vegas Recovery Center, we have a program where we treat co-occurring pain and addiction. I got interested in pain because so many people who were on opioids got on the opioids because of their pain. And I'm, I'm a, a, quite an excellent detox doctor. I, the science of detox is something that I've studied and, and practiced for 35 years. So I can get anybody off any dose of methadone. You know, we have a methadone license so we can take people off hundreds of milligrams of methadone a day, uh, suboxone, fentanyl. But at the end of the day, more than half of those people would say, well, but I'm on this because of pain. What are you going to do about my pain? And in the old days, I'd say, well, <laughs> I don't know. You know, go back to your pain doctor. And of course, that's the person who prescribed the meds in the first place. Not an evil doctor at all but a doctor who had a very limited toolbox and used what he or she had in, her tool, in their toolbox to help the patient get better. So here we are with this misunderstood nature of pain, that it's related to tissue damage, which it's not, that I can study it and define it, which I can't, and then I can fix it by dealing with the tissue damage. And none of that works. So the patient shows up in the doctor's office three months post-operatively. They've done everything right. They're still in pain or they're in worse pain. And they say to the doctor, you know, this is not working. And what's the doctor say back typically? Anybody had that experience or take a guess? Yes. It's working. It, it, it's working. You're crazy. <laughs> or it's working. You're not telling the truth. They don't have anything else. Well, you know, they'll go in and they'll, if they did a discectomy, they'll do a fusion. You know, they'll offer another surgery. But I'm talking about at the end of the road, they, they come in with several interpretations. One is that you, it's not true, that you're lying. The other is, I heard, think I heard it, it's all in your head. And that's terribly insulting, right, to a patient, even though it's quite true. It is in your head, right? So I want to tell you the truth about chronic pain. And before I tell you the truth, I'll, I'll just tell you a, a quick story about my experience with truth and telling the truth. And this was, I was early in my own personal recovery. And I lived in Minneapolis, land of 10,000 treatment centers, right, Jerry McDonald? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I had two dogs, two Russian wolfhounds, Rachmaninoff, Rocky, was the male, very aggressive, had character defects. He dug in the yard, <laughs> you know, furry creatures would attract him and he'd go nuts. And then the female, Sverkai, was a, she was an angel. She, she was just sweet. So one day Rocky comes back from playing in the, we had a big yard, and, and he comes back from playing in the yard and he, in his mouth he has something. It's clearly an object. It's clearly a, a, was alive at one time. <laughs> and is no longer alive. And I wrestle this thing out of his mouth, and it turns out it's a rabbit. 
And not only is it a rabbit, but it's the pet rabbit of the little girl, uh, Lori, who lives next door. I know. Bloody. And so I said, oh, God, you know, I just, we have to go next door and tell them what happened, you know, and offer to replace the rabbit. My partner, Denny, was not in the program. He said, absolutely not. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go over tonight and put that dead rabbit in the cage, and they'll think it died of natural causes. <laughs> I said, look at this, this is ridiculous. He said, not to worry. And he took that dead rabbit into the laundry sink and he got shampoo and he washed off all the dirt and the blood. And then he got conditioner and, you know, softened up the hair. And then, to make matters worse, he got a blow dryer and, you know, fluffed up the hair. And when he was all done, it looked like he was just sleeping, you know. And he tiptoed over and put that dead rabbit back in the cage. I, you know, didn't sleep that night. And, <laughs> the next morning, Sue, who's the mom of the little girl, came over and she said, oh my God, guys, the strangest thing happened. And I was ready. I said, oh, what happened? She said, Fluffy died. I said, oh, how sad. She said, Fluffy died a week ago and we buried him in the yard. <laughs> now, if you don't understand that, ask somebody who's sitting next to you to explain it later. So that's my truth, you know. <laughs> Tell the truth, you don't, you don't get in trouble. So the truth, <laughs> the truth about chronic pain is that all pain is real. That's where we start. And what ends up happening is that when we disbelieve the client, the patient, and now I'm talking about physicians, I'm talking about nurses, I'm talking about therapists, I'm talking about counselors, I'm talking about family members. When we don't believe the patient, we disconnect from our ability to help, right? Because you know, the studies show that the most important thing that we as a clinician do, whether it's a doctor or a nurse or a therapist, the most important thing we do is connect. Communicate, listen, pay attention. It's not whether we are experts in CBT or DBT or motivational interviewing or 12-step facilitated treatment. That is not the, the parameter of success. The parameter of success is connecting to the patient. So what's it like when a patient goes into the doctor and the doctor says, you know, I've done everything I can. There's, not, you know, there's nothing wrong. I, I fixed you. Looks at his or her watch, looks at the computer screen where the record is being recorded, and waits for the patient to leave with their prescription. That's the state of the art of medicine in many cases. And it's sad, and it's ineffective. There was a study that was actually published on the cost of disbelief between a doctor and a patient. Imagine going to a doctor and really knowing, because patients are perceptive, right? Especially patients with chronic pain, if they have addiction on top of it. I mean, these are people that understand how to communicate and what that system is like. And they know when somebody's sitting across the desk and, and not believing them. So here they are in this discounted state not being validated for their experience in the world, not really being able to explain what's happening in their body. That's a, that's a travesty. And, and the key point, and it's the place that I start with all patients, is that I believe that your pain is real. Your pain is a subjective experience. Of course it's real. I can't tell you you're not in pain. Now, if a patient comes in, and they sometimes do, and says, uh, you know, my pain is a 15 out of 10, well, I might say, gee, you know, it can't be 15 out of 10 because 10's the worst it ever gets. Well, it's a 10 plus, 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 you know. Uh, I get it. You're having a lot of pain. And there's a lot of reasons why people experience pain. One of the reasons they experience pain is because if they have a high level of pain, what happens in the doctor's office? They get more medicine, right? Now, that's not a nefarious plan. I'm going to go in and make up my pain. It's having pain and, and justifying receiving a high dose of medication. Why do they want the medication? Mostly not to get high. Mostly they want medication for relief. So that's the first truth. And then we move on to the second truth. So I get a question often. I mean, I get a call from sophisticated physicians, psychologists, therapists, who say to me, or interventionists, and they say the same question all the time, you know, we're not sure if it's real pain or emotional pain. You know, from the clinical presentation, which one do you think it is? I think it's yes. <laughs> real pain and yes, 
emotional pain? Of course. Because emotions and the thoughts related to the emotions drive the experience of pain. Now this seems to me very apparent. I've been doing this work over 10 years and it just, it seems readily, does it seem apparent to you that how you think about the pain and how you feel about the pain drives the pain level up? It's a, it's a tough sell to patients, I can tell you that. And why is that? Because they go back to the original premise. If it's in my head, it must not be real. <laughs> I had a patient, she was, I told her this, you know, I, I lecture at the center and I, you know, I sort of went through this b uh, explanation. I always start with the all pain is real and we got to this one and she's like, wait a minute, are you telling me my pain is in my head? And I said, well, you have chronic headaches, so where else is your pain? <laughs> but the implication that there was some detachment from science, from tissue, was an insult to her. <laughs> she also looked up my bookshelf and she said, I want to borrow that book, Medication for the Treatment of Chronic Pain. I said, you can borrow that book, but that is Meditation for the Treatment of Chronic Pain. <laughs> oh, she said, I wasn't wearing my glasses. <laughs> so I I'm going to review with you some of the science that proves that emotions drive the experience of chronic pain. One of the things that we know is that if we uh, x-ray a, a brain, a functional MRI, so it's a, a magnetic resonance imaging, but it's done while people are doing things. If we show a brain of people in pain and the pain has lasted less than six weeks, the particular part of the brain that lights up is called the thalamus. It's the relay station in the middle part of the brain. In people who have chronic pain, it's an entirely different MRI signature. The Nucleus accumbens, ventral tegmental area, amygdala, and insula light up. Does those names ring a bell to folks? I'm not sure how much science you have, but what's happening in the amygdala and the ventral tegmental area? Does anybody know? It's addiction, ladies and gentlemen. That's where the drugs work. So is it any coincidence that we get into trouble with these medications that work in the part of the brain that we're attempting to modify with medication that's actually responsible for reward and salience and, and well-being? Of course not. Turns out that the, the circuits for pain relief and pain experience are inextricably linked with the circuits for reward and feeling good. So using medication ends up with, with serious complications. We know in experience with patients that fear of the pain is worse than the pain itself. We know that people who resist the pain have more pain than people who allow the pain to be a part of their existence. And it's tough. I had dinner with my cousin George. He's a smart, uh, wonderful guy. He's on his third surgery. He didn't call me first because he knew what I would say. Just had a fusion. So he's two, two weeks post-op. And you know, we talked a little bit about what I'm going to say today. You know, I told him I was doing a, a, a talk, and he said, so what, you know, what's new? You got anything new? I said, no, <laughs> there's nothing new. This, this stuff that I'm telling you this morning was around in uh, 180 A.D. Marcus Aurelius, the Stoics, were all talking about attitude and approach to the experience. You can build a second story on the foundation of pain, or you can change the outcome of the pain. It's, it's been looked at and studied for really centuries. But it's a tough sell. It, you know, we have that mind-body dualism. Like, if it's in the mind, in some way there's some less realness to it than if it's in the body. You know, like a disc is more real than anxiety. Well, it, you, if you know anything about the neurophysiology of, of emotion, it's happening in those areas of the brain that I just described by the communication of n neurons and the neurotransmitters. So dopamine and serotonin and um, GABA, you know, and, and, and the endorphins are all working inside our brains to make every experience that we have. So everything that we experience is science, is, is, is medical, and is real. And yet people get discounted for having this sort of an experience. What I tell patients is that until and unless you deal with the emotions and the experiences related to your pain, you will not get better. They hate it. Because this is much harder work, right? This is the digging in kind of work. This is the looking back at trauma kind of work. This is the 
not going to a doctor and asking to be fixed kind of work. This is a, I got to take care of this myself. George wasn't interested. I said, let, you know, we talked about meditation last time I visited. How, how, are you doing any meditation? Nah. What kind of exercise? Well, the exercise hurts. So the doctor said not to do it. And, it, you know, he's not a slough. The slough. He he's, he's, will do anything <laughs> physical to help himself get better. Okay. Now, the third point is not going to shock anybody in this room, I'm sure, but opioids often make the pain worse. Here's this attempt at relieving the pain actually causes more pain. Uh, the phenomenon that we're talking about is both tolerance and physical dependence, which people in the room are very familiar with, but also a, a phenomenon called opiate-induced hyperalgesia. How many people have heard that term? Opiate-induced hyperalgesia pretty much means hyperalgesia, you know, analgesia is pain relief, hyperalgesia is more pain, and the opioids are causing it. Turns out opioids cause inflammation in the central nervous system. That people on chronic opioids have more pain than they would have if they were off the opioids. And I'll show you a graph of that a little later. Pretty spectacular. And we, I figured that out, <laughs> you know, rocket science. We detox people, and more than half the people had 20% or 40% less pain at the end of detox. And the cool part is they tell other, other clients, other patients, you know, so they don't have to rely on my information. They can see in reality what's happening with people uh, when they get off their opioids. And yet we're chasing this pain with opioids. Uh, death rates are up because of an attempt to medicate this pain. The f Oops. Ah. All right. The fourth principle is that if we're going to treat pain, we ought to treat to improve function. You know, the first question that a patient tends to get asked when he or she walks into a doc's office is, anybody, if they're in pain, what's the first question? What's your pain score? One to ten. I'll write that down. We do it every shift at the center. Nurses do it every shift in hospitals. In fact, they're mandated to do it if they're Joint Commission accredited, aren't they? What a travesty that was. Well, it turns out, instead of asking what's the matter, we should be asking what matters to you. Instead of asking what's your pain score, we should be saying how is your life? Are you working? Do you walk? How many hours of the day are you awake? What's the quality of your life when you're awake? Are you hanging out with your grandkids or are you, you know, sitting in a recliner watching TV? If function shrinks, which it tends to do on chronic opioid therapy, if function is getting worse, then that's not a good treatment. Treatment ought to be about getting people moving, getting them self-efficacious. Uh, and we have some studies that really prove that people who become more self-effective have better outcomes. Uh, Campbell said, look for the joy within, and the joy will burn away the pain. People familiar with acceptance commitment therapy at all? ACT. So that's a therapy that's really about l values. You know, what's important to me? Finding what's important and then developing a committed plan to impact that behavior. So, you know, I had a patient who said, uh, my life is over. You know, he was 68 years old. He had back pain. I said, well, what, you know, what's important to you? And he said, well, I want to go fishing again. I said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, I like to, I'm a fly fisherman, so I, and I can't stand there for more than 20 minutes because I, my back starts to ache. And this is after treatment. So, you know, the pain didn't go away. It got significantly improved. So I said, well, what if you sat on the edge, you know, brought a camp chair? And he said, oh, I couldn't do that. How would that look? <laughs> so we had some food to discuss, right? It's a material. And he went fishing with his grandchild up in Montana. And they, he sat, and the, the kid, you know, ran around on the, on the bank. When we focus on what's important to us, the pain becomes less important, and it actually diminishes. And those are some of the studies. Stephen Hayes, if you're interested in this, uh, wrote a book, Act and, uh, and, and Chronic Pain. And then the last point is that expectations influence outcomes. So what we think is going to happen is more likely to happen if we think it's going to happen, right? I mean, it seems pretty logical to me, but... I can't tell you how many people poo-poo this, but it, the, the data that we have is pretty substantial on the fact that if you believe something, it happens. 
the best data is about placebos. Everybody knows what a placebo is, right? It's an inert substance. If I give everybody in the room an inert substance, a, a pill, uh, and I tell you it's going to have an effect, like you'll have less pain in 20 minutes, about a quarter of you will have less pain in 20 minutes. That's almost as good as opioid treatment. Opioids do like 28 to 30 percent in their efficacy studies. So nothing but a suggestion makes you as good with no side effects as an opioid. That's pretty substantial. Um, in, if I give you a blue and white capsule, it is more likely to help, just because it's a blue and white capsule. So they've studied that. And if I tell you I'm giving you a blue and white capsule that really doesn't do anything except empower your brain to cause you to have less pain, it works just as well. Despite the fact that we know that it's a placebo, it still works. It's pretty fascinating. There's also the nocebo effect. Nocebo is the opposite of placebo. Nocebo, I give everybody in the, uh, in the room a pill, and I say within about 20 minutes you're going to have severe abdominal pain. What percentage of you do you imagine would have abdominal pain? 80%. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The power of the negative is like Velcro, you know? The positive is, is like Teflon, you know? It's like if I give a talk and then and I go up to some, people come up to me and they say, great talk, great talk, great talk. And somebody says, oh, you were off today, Mel. And it's like, I knew it, I knew it, you know? <laughs> Let, tell me what, why you said that. You know, and that's sociologically driven. You, do you know that? I mean, we're basically attuned to notice bad things because bad things would kill us in the old days. So the brain is, is created so that it can tell if something bad is coming. And it's much more attentive to that. I think that's pretty bad news because it makes us all very unhappy, <laughs> it seems to me. You know, <laughs> Woody Allen, not, I'm not a fan, but he said something really smart, which is pessimists have a more realistic view of life but optimists live longer. And, and they've shown, people who come into treatment like mine and, and some of yours, if they believe that the treatment's going to work, cognitive behavioral therapy, if you believe it's going to work, it's like 80% more effective than if you say, this is a bunch of BS, it's not going to work. So what's that about? It's us mobilizing those same neurotransmitters to make life happen the way we want it to happen. We are very powerful creatures. Okay. So there's a lot of things that influence pain. One of them is culture. The culture that we're raised in influences the amount of pain that we have. Does that sound reasonable? I'll, I'll give you an example. I was raised in a Jewish household. And in my household, it was not only acceptable to feel and talk about pain, it was expectable. <laughs> my mom had terrible back pain. You know, now I have terrible back pain. And she was a real kvetch. I mean, you know, it was like, and she didn't have to say much. It was like, Ma, how you doing? Uh, <laughs> that's all it took. You know, right? There's people in the audience who know just what I'm talking about. God bless her, you know? So, and as a result of that, I think, I like to talk about my pain. Did I mention that I had back pain? I did. <laughs> but I also have a rotator cuff tear on the left. And I'm thinking of getting stem cells injected in it, you know. You don't care. <laughs> you. But there are people in the world, I've been told, I've actually met him. I, had, I work with a nurse practitioner. He was about 300 pounds, German stock raised on a farm. He had a ruptured disc. I saw his MRI. It's way worse than mine. And he had, I presume, worse pain than I did. However, you know, Paul, how you doing today? <laughs> you know, <laughs> That's what he would say. And he would, you know, move about jovial. I mean, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sitting over there. I also have a tennis elbow. <laughs> and one day, honestly, this is a true story. I was rubbing on my elbow, and he's like, "How are you doing today, Mel?" I said, "Oh God, my elbow is killing me." He said, "Really? What's the cause of death going to be on your death certificate?" <laughs> That's my line. That's what I say to patients when they say their back is killing me. But listen to that cognitive distortion. My body part is killing me. My feet are on fire. I can't get out of bed. You know, the power of our minds. So culture, but context is really important. So even though I'm whining a little, I mean, I'm sort of making a point, I'm going to spend the next you know, couple hours with you guys doing the best I can to, to tell you what I know. But if I'm done, 
I'm going back to the hotel and I got an ice pack ready and I got this orange ball that massages my back. And if you call me then, boy, I, we, I'll have a lot to tell you. You know, they didn't laugh at my jokes and they were, oh, Jesus, it was a terrible morning. So you get it. Anticipation previous experience is probably one of the biggest cognitive drivers of pain. So think about this. If you if you've had an experience, so I had a guy who, who had terrible ear pain. He had tinnitus ringing in his ears, and it, it was a painful experience. Seventy years old, plagued with this tinnitus. Fear dominated his life. And he, he came to detox finally. I mean, we probably talked ten times uh, within a three-month period, and he finally screwed up his courage, and he came to treatment. And he was in detox, and he was doing way better than he thought. And at the sixth or seventh day, and he was on high doses of fentanyl and tramadol and uh, some, some benzos. A at seventh day in detox, I said, H how are you doing today? And he said, you know, I'm not doing too bad. My pain's about a four. And he, he hadn't been under an eight for 10 years. I said, four, that's pretty good. He said, yeah, but it's rising. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what does that mean? He said, oh, I know, you know, once I get up and move around and I'm going to hear sounds, and uh, it's going to be an eight. I said, you know. That's a pretty powerful certainty. I had a woman a patient who was, she had chronic headaches, and, which is a common diagnosis for us. She was at the nurse's station at the end of her detox, and she'd been on crazy. Dose. She was on like 300 milligrams of methadone a day and uh, hydrocodone for breakthrough pain, 80, 100 milligrams a day, and 60 milligrams of Valium a day, and 30 milligrams of Ambien at night, and Adderall for her ADHD and, and fatigue, you know. And she went through a very rough detox, as you can imagine. At the end of the 10th day, she was done. And she was at the nurse's station. It was 9.45, first group's at 10. And she's kind of wailing. Oh, my head, my head, oh, God, my head. And she had a cloth over her eyes. And the nurse said, well, you know, let's get you some meds and, and go to group, you know, because first group of the day, process group, is important. She's like... Oh, I can't go to group. I can't go to group. That would be crazy. I, no, I have to go lie down. When I have this bad a headache, I lie down. So, uh, you know, they called the counselor. The counselor couldn't get it through to her. Uh, and then they called me. <laughs> so I said, tell me, tell me what's going on. And she, she said, you know, terrible pain. This, you know, this is what happens. I knew it was going to happen. Knew this wasn't going to work. I need my meds. I need my methadone. And I said, well, here's the deal. You need to go to group. What are you, crazy? I, if I go to group, my head's going to explode. I said, oh, well, then you better sit near the door, you, you know, <laughs> and, and bring a pail, you, you know. She didn't, she didn't laugh at all. I mean, you know, no sense of humor. She got real red in the face, and she said, oh, you, you know, you just don't understand any men. She MF'd me, and she just, you know. And, and, and I said, look, if you go lie down, when you wake up, when you get up, you should pack. Because, you know, her mom had cashed in her, her 401k to, to pay for treatment. This woman that I'm talking about was 52 years old. She'd spent 20 hours a day in bed with headaches in a dark room. Mom, you know, bathed her in her bed. So this was a pretty d severe case. I said, if, you know, if you get up, we can't help you. Well, you know, she got out, she jumped out of the chair, threw the rig over in the corner and stomped off to group. Ah, son of a bitch. Ah, 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 pat my bed. Ah. <laughs> she went to group, and guess what the topic of the group was? Oh. Anger and resentment. <laughs> and she spoke first <laughs> and kept speaking, you know. And at the end of the group, her pain was a seven. She came to me reluctantly to tell me that for the first time in 30 years, she had a different experience of the pain. And that was the first day she began to get better, because she could see that different action would get a different response. But she was so frightened and so convinced. And p patients are. They are certain that they can't do it. And then finally, the emotions and the cognitive factors that drove uh, Felicia, who I was talking about, and drove the gentleman with the vertigo, John, are really the drivers of that pain. We have to deal with the thoughts and feelings. No matter what their surgical outcome is, no matter what medications they're on, no matter where they live, no matter their sex, no matter their 
cultural re relationship, we have to deal with their thoughts and feelings, what the, the messages are, the narratives, if you will. And those are usually false. People familiar with CBT, yeah? You know, so substituting a truth for a false and a warm thought for a cold thought help people get better. Let's see. So physiologically, there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens that I've been talking about. Acute pain, transient activation of the nervous system, comes, it's gone, it, it goes, it never comes back. But chronic pain is related to sustained currents. So picture that bulging disc on that nerve in my back. It sends a signal over and over and over, and our brains are, are subject to the effect of a chronic signal, and they respond. So there becomes a heightened sensitivity because the brain says, there's something going on in his back and, and I need to pay attention to it. In fact, there's nothing significant going on. I mean, I've had this for 30 years. There's nothing I can't do. I hike mountains, I, I scuba dive, I, uh, you know, I walk, I run, I lift weights, I stand, I could stand on my head, but it makes me very dizzy, so I, I don't do that. But everything else, it, so it's, it's a maladaptive signal coming from my brain. My brain thinks it's important, it's not important. My brain reacts as if it's important, and of course over time, with chronic signaling, the brain changes. The ability to diminish the signal is diminished, the enhancement occurs, there's a phenomenon in the spinal column called wind-up, and I picture it just like tightening a spring in response to the chronic signal. That's chronic pain, totally different animal than acute pain. And this is what it looks like. A healthy brain on top, chronic pain with significant atrophy. I mean, there should be uh, activity in the prefrontal cortex here that's, that's in a normal brain. And the thalamus, I mentioned, is in this area, lit up in a healthy brain, not lit up in the chronic brain. And then this area is lit up, which is partly the area of the, the uh, emotional, uh, the limbic system. Last thing about, uh, about pain is that some people feel more pain than others. Would you agree? Yeah. You know the type, right? So, and this slide signifies that nociception, which is the sensory experience of pain, turns into pain differently in different people. The reason for the difference is an enzyme variance called COMT. COMT is catechol-O-methyltransferase. And I thank God every day I can still say that. You know, the day I can't say it, I'm hanging up my shingle. <laughs> so COMT metabolizes things like adrenaline and dopamine. There's a difference in the way these neurotransmitters are metabolized because of a difference in the nature of COMT. So let me give you an example. I can't, I can't leave this, right? All right, what's your name, ma'am? Trish? So I poke Trish this hard, hard enough to make my fingernail white, barely. And Trish has this COMT that makes the pain really big, so what does she do? She starts to yell, oh my God, please don't hit me anymore. Oh, you're killing me, oh, go, please. Now, what would we say about Trish? Don't be nice. <laughs> In this example, overreacting. What else? What, other words? Drama queen. <laughs> Wuss, <laughs> big baby, right? Histrionic, you know, we might, we might get a little clinical. But we would be labeling and judging her, wouldn't we? When we see her behavior, and I just got through telling you that she has an enzyme and that's the reason why she has sensitivity. Isn't that something? Now, ma'am, what's your name next to Trish? Marilyn. Marilyn. I poke Marilyn the same pressure and Marilyn says, dude, you poke me again, I'm gonna slug you. She doesn't feel the same as Trish in this example. There's two things that are responsible for COMT variants. One is genetics. Think about families you've had if there's somebody with pain and think about their genogram. You know, what's it like in the generation above and in their kids? It's not uncommon to see a, a woman with fibromyalgia, for example, and a young boy with uh, shin splints or, uh, you know, growing pains, because nobody understands what's going on. And in fact, they both have a, an increased sensitivity to pain that's genetically transmitted. The second thing that influences COMT is trauma. You know, 
we, we talked about a trauma-informed program here, and many of you are, are aware of the impact of trauma on addiction and on, uh, and, and for us it, it's acutely involved with chronic pain and chronically involved with chronic pain. 80% of the patients who come to our center have identified trauma. And it could be childhood sexual trauma, it could be uh, exposure, you know, uh, we, we uh, take tri, tri West so we see veterans uh, or first responders who've witnessed some horrific things. Uh, and then we see people who have medical trauma you know, the patient who's gone from doctor to doctor, surgery to surgery, and after the fourth surgery, not only are they in, in worse pain, they have the doctor accidentally cut the tube that goes to their bladder, and they're peeing into a nephrostomy bag for the rest of their life. And they spent two months with an infection in the ICU. That's extraordinarily traumatizing. And we see a lot of folks who have medical trauma. And, and sometimes it's compound trauma. Those same people have had childhood sexual trauma or emotional uh, distress uh, uh, growing up. So this is a scenario of the physiology of pain sensitivity. What this looks like, uh, I, I ask everybody just look at the slides if you're dozing or uh, you know looking at your cell phone. Just look at the slide for a minute. A normal pain response shows lit up areas of the brain. There's the prefrontal cortex, the thalamus, the insula. Look at the next slide at what the brain of, in this case, Trish looks like. So we poke one person and they have a little response. We poke somebody who has CMT variants and they have a high response and that's called central sensitization. The conditions that are associated with central sensitization are fibromyalgia, chronically misunderstood disease. I give a variation of this talk to physicians at a course called Pain Week. <laughs> Can you just imagine? It's 1,800 physicians pharmaceutically driven, if you know what I mean. I mean, the booth spaces are as big as this room. Yeah. Purdue Pharma has a booth, you know, with a version of OxyContin that can't be crushed. And they have a big <laughs> anvil that comes down and bangs it every five seconds, and sh they show you. That's the, that's the kind of conference. And, <laughs> in the, the, and I give a lecture, of course, on non-pharmacological treatment of chronic pain. <laughs> you know, 20 people show up <laughs> out of 1,800. <laughs> but uh, when I get to this part, I ask how many doctors think fibromyalgia is a real disease? And less than 20% raise their hand. Chronically misunderstood, disbelieved. Imagine what it's like for a patient to go to a doctor with diffuse pain all over his or her body, complain to the doctor, and the doctor doesn't believe that it's real. Oh, she's a crock. She's an overreactor, a wuss, just like Trish. <laughs> Chronic headaches are in this category. Interstitial cystitis is in this category. <laughs> Complex regional pain syndrome, if you've heard of that. Crohn's and abdominal syndromes are related to central sensitization as well. And it's just like the volume knob inside this pain system is turned up. And what do we think influences this pain system inside the middle part of the brain? Anxiety, anger, fear, depression. That's why we have to deal with those things, because we can help Patients deal with those things, and then they suffer less as a result of this. So pain is bigger than the injury, but suffering is way bigger than pain. That's really what we're talking about, the human response to the experience of pain. And this is not my deal. This is thousands of years ago. I talked about the Stoics. This is a quote. When touched with a feeling of pain, the ordinary uninstructed person sorrows, grieves, and laments, beats his breast, becomes distraught. So he feels two pains physical and mental, right? That's what we've been talking about all morning. Just as if they were to shoot a man with an arrow and right afterward were to shoot him with another one so he would feel the pain of two arrows said by the Buddha 2,500 years ago, right? The, the Buddhists knew this. Buddha, you know, who knows how he knew it intuitively. But this is not new stuff. We in Western medicine lost track of this response system and that's why we don't do well treating chronic pain. So we're not talking about anybody who has pain longer than six months. We're talking about somebody who has pain longer than six months and is in trouble. That's who I see referred to me. I mean, there's a bunch of you in the room, I'm not going to ask, but who probably have chronic pain and function decently or greatly, you know, and, and are not dependent on medications. But chronic pain syndrome 
is pain, the emotional drivers that we've talked about, the depression, anxiety, anger, and fear, restriction of daily activity, so decreased function, excessive use of medications and medical services with or without addiction, multiple non-productive test treatment and surgeries, and finally, no clear relationship to the organic disorder. So it's that chronically misunderstood group that falls into this category. Here's one of the problems. What's your pain score? How much does it hurt? It's whatever the patient says it is. The clinical definition of pain is whatever the patient says it is, unless proven otherwise. Well, how are we going to prove that your 10 isn't a 10? Trish is always at a 10. Sorry, Trish, but you're just, you're just sitting there, you know? Right? It's a, yeah, no, it's a, keep doing it. So she has a sensitivity to pain. That's her pain. Now, just because I poke uh, Marilyn, sorry, poke Marilyn with the same pressure and she has a different experience of pain doesn't make her more accurate. But you know what's interesting? I, I, so I've asked audiences, why do you, th do you disbelieve the patient and his or her pain score? And the reason is, if I had a 10, I would be calling the ambulance. You know, she says she's in a 10 and she's sitting there you know, going out and shooting the breeze with other patients. And that happens in our center. But, uh, you know, your 10 is your 10. Does that make sense? My niece says, I, I got distracted, my niece says, or, or for me, call the wambulance, you know. <laughs> Wah. <laughs> She's very disrespectful. She doesn't care about her uncle's pain at all. So our goals for pain management really are about function. These should be the first and primary goals for any pain patient. And reducing discomfort by 50%, these are our treatment goals at, at LVRC. Improve function and reduce discomfort by 50%. Some people come in functional, so it's really just about maintaining function. And we do that with a whole variety of interventions that we'll talk about in a few moments, actually after the break. There are things to do that aren't opioids, right, for, for pain, medications, the NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medicines, so we're talking about ibuprofen and aspirin and Voltaren or uh, diclofenac, naproxen, uh, meloxicam, you know, there's a bunch, probably 15 or 20, that work at the peripheral site of the pain. They work on prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are inflammatory uh, <coughs> neurotransmitters that work at the, at the nerve here. They don't work in the brain. Therefore, it reduces pain, but it doesn't do anything for what's happening in the brain. I actually had a patient who was, uh, he was, uh, had Oxycontin, you know, six 80s a day and some other crazy amount of drugs. He was on like 400 milligrams of morphine equivalents per day, and CDC stays, says you ought to stay under 50. So he, he said, I, he was two years clean, going to meetings, healthy recovery, sponsor, sponsoring somebody, and he said, Doc, I'm going for my wisdom teeth being pulled. I'm really panicked and, I, you know, what do I do about the pain? I don't want to take any opioids. And I said, well, you know, ibuprofen should work. Try 600, 800 milligrams as long as the dentist says it's okay. Calls me back the next day, said, ah, that ibuprofen, all it did was take the pain away. <laughs> but you get it, right? Yeah. It didn't give him any of the effect of the opioids, so it wasn't effective. And he, he had enough insight and self-awareness to realize that that was not true. But that's what patients experience. If you're looking for the relief and the energy and the, uh, the well-being that opioids offer, you will be disappointed. But if you're looking for analgesia, 600 milligrams of morphine is equivalent to 5 milligrams of hydrocodone. Head-to-head -head trial. Try, uh, antidepressants are effective on serotonin and on norepinephrine. And what we know is that the body has its own pain inhibiting tracks so that we are able to take pain down. And the way we do that in our own body is with serotonin and with norepinephrine. So supplementing serotonin with the tricyclics, if people are familiar with those, we're talking about amitriptyline and nortriptyline. Elevil is one of the brand names. They're very sedating. Uh, their side effect profile is a little tough but we use them pretty regularly at the center. They're not habit habituating, and they induce sleep. And sleeplessness is one of the biggest problems for people with chronic pain, as you can imagine. So, uh, and, and pretty low dose. The SNRI, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, are drugs like duloxetine, brand name Cymbalta, 
uh, Ben Lefexin, brand name Effexor, Des Ben Lefexin is Pristique. Those are, again, work on serotonin and norepinephrine, which are uh, activate our own tract. So uh, Cymbalta or Duloxetine is indicated for central sensitization. The other antidepressants like uh, Celexa and Lexapro and Zoloft, they're serotonergic, but they don't do as much for the chronic pain syndrome. Uh, anticonvulsants are an interesting class of drugs. The two most common, gabapentin, brand name is Neurontin, or pregabalin, brand name is Lyrica, have some serious abuse potential. People seen abuse with gabapentin? Yeah, concerning enough that we use them, if we use them, we use them judiciously. They are sedating. They're not, they, they stimulate GABA, which is the same thing that benzos stimulate, but in a different way. So they, they're not as risky to use, but uh, they, they are helpful for neuropathic pain. So nerve pain is diminished by uh, uh, Neurontin or, or, uh, or Lyrica. And then uh, Topamax or Topiramate is helpful for chronic headaches. Uh, and some of the other anticonvulsants actually are, are helpful as well. So they're, they're on the list. Uh, muscle relaxants, probably not greatly effective. Drugs like um, baclofen, Leoracil, uh, Robaxin, uh, Scalaxin, Tizanidine are all sort of moderately effective. The one drug to avoid is Soma. Soma is just a bad drug. Every, does everybody know that? Yeah. Soma is carizoprodol. Carizoprodol turns into meprobamate, which is an anxiolytic drug that my mother Milltown. My mom took it for her anxiety. So God knows that was 50 years ago. You know, I drove her crazy. She'd take him. Ah, I got to take a Milltown. You know, my back is killing me. You know, but Soma is a brain relaxant, just like Valium is a brain relaxant. So it's a bad drug. It's off the market in Europe. They scheduled it up, but it's still available in the United States. And at Pain Week, you know, a different doctor said, "Oh no, Soma is the best muscle relaxant, Doctor Paul." I said, "Well, what makes you say that?" He said, "Well, that's the one the patient comes in asking for. <laughs> so it must be effective." In Las Vegas, it's called the Las Vegas cocktail: hydrocodone and carizoprodol. Soma, highly abused. And then finally, topicals: things that we can put on the skin in the form of a patch or a cream or a gel can be somewhat effective. So you can have lidocaine in a gel or a patch. You can have an anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen. We actually mix up a, a the Walgreens mixes up for the patient a, a combination of a gabapentin capsule and ibuprofen and lidocaine. And they, they rub it on the, the sore joint or sore area. And it, you know, it's not going to bring the pain from an eight to a two, but it might bring the pain from an eight to a seven and a half. And then we work around the edges of that pain. We, we send the patient out for a walk, and their pain goes down a, a, a point. So now we're at six and a half. And then we give them a meditation, and their pain goes down another point. So now we're at five and a half. And then they hang out with their friends, and they have a good laugh and stimulate their dopamine. And they're down to a three. You know, 50% pain reduction with no habituating medications and mostly self-efficacious behaviors. That's the, that's the key, working around the edges of the pain. So, let's see. Is it time for a break? What do you think? Yeah? Yes. I know who wants to go to the bathroom. It's all uh, Okay. Let's take, uh, it is, what, 10.05. Let's take 15 minutes. Come back at 10.20. Is that fair? Okay. Okay. 10.20. Okay, so now we're going to get to opioids and look at how this, this bigger problem uh, developed. And this is our medical model to treating what we call non-malignant pain. So, you know, opioids were indicated for cancer, end-of-life care, and then the, it expanded to this non-malignant pain category. So, you know, the, the beginning is sensible. If it hurts, try ibuprofen. And somebody asked at the break about the combination of ibuprofen and acetaminophen. Uh, healthy combination, work a little differently so that you can safely take both or alternate uh, ibuprofen with Tylenol uh, with great efficacy. Watch out, Tylenol can be toxic to the liver over three grams per day. And of course, the NSAIDs are not without side effects. They can affect kidneys and heart and the GI tract. All right, so we start with ibuprofen, but let's say it hurts really a lot. 
So the patient goes to the doctor, doctor, the ibuprofen isn't working. What can you do? Well, let's try hydrocodone. Let's try five milligrams three times a day. Okay, it works for a month, and then they come back and they say, oh, you know what? Uh, five milligrams three times a day, I'm running out. I take it four times a day. Oh, well, okay, I'll give you 120 this month. Well, after a couple of months, hydrocodone really isn't working hardly at all. So what do I do? If it really hurts, I give you oxycodone, which is a much more potent form of opiate. Oxycodone, the active ingredient in Oxycontin. If it still really hurts, what do I do? I give more, you know, raise the dose. And of course, we know it's going to cause tolerance, so it's a logical consequence. If it really hurts for a long time, I keep giving more. And, and sooner or later, I say, you're an addict, you're a drug seeker, you know, I can't help you anymore. Now the CDC's gotten involved and, and people are being asked to take less opioid, of course, and that's a, a different problem. But what happens if it gets worse no matter what I prescribe? I discharge the patient. <laughs> you know, that's a terrible formula. Something is just not right with that. By the way, these slides, if you want them, can you, you make them available or? Uh, yes. yes. So t talk to you. Uh, just well, drop off your card with your email and we'll email it to you. OK, there you have it. Great, thank you. So what about opioids? Should we never use them? If we use them, we should try them. You know, we should see at that point with the hydrocodone is working, that's a reasonable clinical trial, but I have to keep assessing. And what am I going to assess? I'm always going to want to know what the pain score is, even though it's less relevant than function. How far are you walking? What, what goals are you achieving? Are you able to work? Are you sleeping well? Are you up and around? And it's important at this point to get collateral information from somebody else other than the patient, because he or she doesn't always see the, the, the whole picture. Um, and if the ongoing assessment says, you know, we, we need to go to this oxycodone and it looks like I need to give you more, the solution to that problem is to have an exit strategy and plan to get you off these medicines. We start out with no exit strategy. It's like getting into an airplane without landing gear. Nobody would do that, but that's what we do. So we end up on this road and now we're there. You know, people are on high-dose opioids. CDCs come along and say, bad idea. <laughs> Pull back, cut down, eliminate, and we have no plan for those patients. They are opioid orphans right now. And it's a terrible tragedy in our culture. You know, people are becoming suicidal. People are going to illicit substances sometimes. Uh, they're desperate. And that's not the solution to the opioid epidemic. The CDC guidelines say it's not never, it's not always, it depends should we use opioids. And this is, of course, for chronic pain. I'll, I'll mention acute pain uh, momentarily. They say that it should be a part of a larger comprehensive management program based on assessment, trust, relationship, and verification, relationship with the clinician. <clears throat> the, it should be conscientious judicious use, balance risks and benefits, informed consent and agreement, what you should expect, what you will do in response to getting this prescription, communicating and connecting and reassessing regularly. You know, how's the analgesic effect? How's your daily living activities? What are the side effects? What is your aberrant behavior? So, you know, if you're always running out or if you're going to multiple pharmacies or uh, if, you know, you need a brand name instead of a generic, these are sort of clues that something not, might not be right. And uh, is there frank addiction? Uh, the dose of opioid correlates with bad outcome. So the CDC tells us, try and stay under 50 morphine milligram equivalents a day. That's about 50 milligrams of hydrocodone a day. Pretty hefty dose. Avoid increasing greater than 90 or justify a decision to titrate the dosage up. Why? Because the more opioid you're on, the more risk of death. Oops. 11 times the risk of death at 100 milligrams of morphine. Simple formula. The more you take, the more likely to have respiratory depression and die. Probably a bad idea to, to go over 50. 
Guess who doesn't like that recommendation? Pharmaceutical manufacturers. They fought tooth and nail against these, and they're still fighting. You know, the headline in the New England Journal last month was, uh, CDC guidelines backfire, inappropriate. You're looking at the CDC guidelines. They're not inappropriate. They're measured. They're recommendations for clinical consideration. They don't say you can't go over 90 milligrams of morphine equivalent. They say if you do that, you have to justify it clinically. You know, my colleagues who uh, rile about that, what I say to them is tough. You should have been doing this all along. This one is really very important to know. Long-term opiate use begins with the treatment of acute pain. So we're talking about people get stuck on them. They get stuck on them by starting. So the recommendation is give the lowest dose of immediate release opioids. That means nine hydrocodone a day. Three days will often be sufficient. More than seven will rarely be needed. The reason for that is the longer you use opioids, the greater the risks, and the risks seem to rise fast. So this slide shows that if you're on an opioid for 10 days, the chance that you'll be on it at a year is 21%. If you're on them for 30 days, the chance that you'll be on them at three years is 22%. So a quarter of people, if they take an opioid for 30 days, which is, used to be a typical prescription for a toothache, right, or a dental procedure, there's a 22% likelihood you're going to be on them later. I went for a minor surgical procedure. I told the doctor that I was a man in long-term recovery and that I did not want opioids. And she said, I'm going to give you a little prescription just in case. Well, look what she gave. 50 10 milligram Percocets. Can you believe that? <laughs> Isn't it? You know, I, and I woke up from anesthesia to that. She was long gone. Now, I'll tell you a quick story about how this is working. So there's three people on the side of a river. Beautiful, beautiful day. Sun is shining. The river is getting more rough because it's going to a waterfall. You can see the spray from the waterfall up the river. And, and then you're just luxuriating. And all of a sudden, a baby is in the river, bobbing around. And then another baby. And then another baby. And before they know it, the river is filled with babies. Well, the one guy jumps into the river and gathers up as many babies as he can and brings them back to the side and jumps in again. The second guy goes into the woods and puts a bunch of twigs together with uh, vines to make a raft and he piles a bunch of babies on the raft to save them. The third is a woman. She runs away. Now, where the heck do you think she went? She went up the river to find out who's throwing in the goddamn babies. <laughs> this is who's throwing in the goddamn opioids. The doctor who prescribes 50 10 milligram Percocet to a patient who says, I don't want them, and who doesn't need them. And that's what's happening. So there's a big pushback. Again, Big Pharma doesn't like the fact that the CDC said three days and seven days. Most patients have no problem with this. Most patients don't take nine pills postoperatively, even if it's major surgery. It's fascinating data. So the opioids are not benign substances. They have lots of side effects. The worst side effect of opioids, anybody? Constipation. It sounds a little ridiculous, but constipation we had a patient who was an 80-year-old. She had been a maid. She was injured in a, a, she lifted a mattress and injured her back, had back surgery, was on 100 milligrams of hydrocodone a day, and was so constipated, she was workers' comp, so they sent her to us to detox her. She was so constipated that she was suicidal. The only way she could move her bowels was to manually disimpact herself every 10 days. That means put her hand up her butt with all the laxatives. I mean, she, was, she wanted to die. And we detoxed her, and she got diarrhea for a few days, of course. But she uh, you know, got her life back. But there's good news. At Pain Week this year, there was an actual course in opiate-induced constipation. And of course, there are two drugs. That's an ad for one of them. My opioids have stopped me up. And one of the smart pharmaceutical Madison Avenue companies has now called it painstipation. 
if anybody saw the, the Super Bowl a couple years ago, there was an ad with a really hot guy, and he said, oh, my doctor put me on opioids, and my life was so miserable. But I got Relastor, and now I can move my bowels whenever I want. It's like, oh, geez. But that's not all. There are other side effects. There's uh, sleep apnea is increased to, uh, by more than 50% in people who are on high-dose opiates, especially methadone. Hormonal changes, lowered estrogen, lowered testosterone to the point where men and women both have trouble with their bone density, so they can have fra increase in fractures. There's trouble with the immune system. Uh, there's trouble with cognitive function. So these aren't benign drugs. Everybody gets tolerant or physically dependent to some degree. And as a result of being physically dependent, between doses, pain goes up. So, you know, it's one of these dynamics where I'll say to a patient, I'll do a pre-admission assessment, and they're on, you know, crazy high doses of opioids, they're in bed 20 hours or 15 hours out of the day, and I say, we can take you off your opioid and you will get better. And you know what they say? No, no, doc, I tried it. I couldn't go more than 12 hours without my opioid. My pain went to a 20. Well, that's withdrawal. They don't identify withdrawal because they don't identify with addiction. They're just taking the drugs for the pain. So it's a very complex process, and the convincing the patient is really part of the work. You know, with motivational interviewing, you know, I could talk till I'm blue in the face. When they go to group and they're sitting with another patient who said, I thought he was full of it too, but look, I'm power walking out there, and I'm not taking any opioids, and my pain is a three. You can't argue with that. Loss of function we've already covered. Uh, the people who take opioids for their emotional pain because they perceive emotional pain as physical pain are called chemical copers. I think that's actually a pejorative term that was created by a pharma guy. Uh, but, you know, I had a, a woman who said, well, I, I, the, my back is better, but I want to take the hydrocodone because I get along with my husband better when I take a couple in the morning. <laughs> and then I mentioned opiate-induced hyperalgesia. This is what it looks like. When we increase the dose of the opioid, up, 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 pain goes down, and when we get to here, let's say that's 50 milligrams of hydrocodone a day, if we keep pushing the dose of the opioid, the pain level goes up. This was described as long ago as 2003. Nobody was paying any attention, Dr. Mao and Dr. Ballantyne, and we have lots of data and support that opioids are pro-inflammatory inside the central nervous system. Okay, where are we going next? So. God, that's a very big pendulum. <laughs> it used to be smaller. I don't know what that's about. Anyway, so this opioid story is like a pendulum swinging back and forth. The 1900s and early 2000s, this was uh, marketed by Bayer. It's a form of aspirin that contains, as you can see, the very comfortable ingredient heroin. Well, in the 20 years that followed, people became addicted to opioids. Uh, heroin was very popular, and the government said, this is a big problem, and they passed the Harrison Narcotic Act, and they made it illegal to prescribe opiates uh, to anybody who had a suspicion of addiction. And that's the law today. It's what makes you unable to prescribe an opioid if it's a diagnosis of addiction unless you have a methadone license. That said, things got very tight in the opioid area until I mentioned we got to hospice where people were dying and they were suffering needlessly. So the hospice people got interested in a thing called Brompton's mixture that has cocaine and uh, alcohol and opiate, uh, I believe it's fentanyl, and they eased some of the pain of people who were dying. Nobody's going to argue with that. It was a short-term uh, solution. If somebody got addicted or dependent, who, who cares? You know, If they overdose and die and they lose a, a few days of their life and they suffer less, there seemed to be a logic to that. But then what happened was some group, let's call them Purdue Pharma, <laughs> for example, <laughs> or Janssen Pharmaceuticals, or Teva Pharmaceuticals, or Cephalon, got together and they said, look, Here's what we're selling now. Here's the market. 30 million people in America are dying of cancer, and their average lifespan is 90 days. You know, that's a pretty limited market. We've got 125 million Americans identify with chronic non-malignant pain, and they're going to live for decades. That's our market. 
and they went after him hard. They went after him uh, tenaciously. And you probably have been reading that Purdue Pharma just settled in Oklahoma for $27 million, which is chump change in my opinion. But at least the, the, the ball is starting to roll and there are going to be consequences to these companies. But Purdue Pharma created OxyContin. Now, OxyContin was falsely uh, promoted as a long-acting drug that could not be abused when they well knew that all you had to do was crush the tablet and snort it or smoke it or inject it, and it was highly addicting. It was, uh, caused a, a scourge of deaths in, in uh, West Virginia particularly. They knew that. In fact, the, the chairman of the board of Purdue Pharma was sentenced to time, and the company was fined $600 million, which sounds kind of like a lot of money. You know what it was to them? Cost of doing business. Their profits that year on OxyContin were $13 billion. $600 million. Yeah, we can, we can manage that. So, and what have they done lately? Well, they created an OxyContin that can't be crushed. <laughs> That's the one with the anvil I told you about. Except my patients tell me if you freeze it and then put it in the microwave, you can smack the hell out of it and it, and it breaks. It's not like you can legislate a, a, an addict out of using, right? And And... Do you know Purdue Pharma is not marketing OxyContin anymore? That's their, their position. And they, but they have a new product. Do you know what that new product is? Suboxone. The balls. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine creating OxyContin, causing an addiction crisis, causing 500 million Americans to overdose and die, and now I've created a drug to treat what I've created? I tell you. So, we are in an epidemic, and I just want to show you some of the data that supports that. This is treatments of non-heroin opiates, and just we're going to look for 10 years from 1999 to 2009, and just pay attention to the red states, because those are the high incidence of, tre of treatment. And just watch what happens in 10 years. Right? When I was at the Meadows, the people in Arizona were very proud of the fact that Arizona is not uh, red. But that's, that's the, the trend. With more treatment and more use, there's more deaths. 42,000 deaths from opioids in 2016. And this is all about treatment and deaths correlate with opioid sales very clearly. So what Purdue Pharma and other pharmaceutical companies, I'm uh, an expert in some of these tr trials, so I know some of the inside scoop. Basically what they did was they had four messages that their cadre of employed pain experts, these are people who dressed up real nice and went into doctor's offices to sell their drugs, to convince doctors to prescribe. They came into my office, I'm a family doc, and they said, doctor, you're needlessly allowing patients to suffer because you're opiophobic, <laughs> right? Got my guilt going, you know, a little Jewish guilt. <laughs> So loosen up your prescribing practice. And I said, well, do they work well? Yeah, opioids are safe and effective for chronic pain. Do you know how many studies they have to prove that? None. To this day, none. But then, absolutely none. They said that opioid therapy can be easily discontinued if you're taking the opioid for pain. Why? Why wouldn't you get dependent like somebody who has addiction? That doesn't make a lot of sense. But that's what they told us. And then the biggest lie of all is that opiate addiction is rare in pain patients. Now that one they proved with a study. Study in the New England Journal of Medicine, very prominent uh, journal, from Porter and Jick in 1980. So it's an old study, but they quoted that when they came to my office and they said, Doctor, only four out of 11,882 patients treated with opiates developed addiction. If that's true, you can't get addicted, right? Would you like to see that study? That's it. It was a letter to the editor of the New England Journal of a retrospective review in hospitals. They looked at 40,000 charts, 11,882 patients who received at least one narcotic preparation. There were only four cases of reasonably well-documented addiction, which means the, ch the word addiction was written in the chart. Only four. That's their proof has nothing to do with chronic use, has nothing to do with the truth, because you know we don't document addiction in a general hospital. People die of cirrhosis of the liver, and alcoholism isn't anywhere on their death certificate. So 
this was a bogus study. It's been refuted, and, and you know the people that published it are embarrassed. But this was the basis for the pharmaceutical companies influencing doctors to say, write as much as you want. It's going to help them, and they're not going to get in any trouble. Oops. God, I'm not dangerous with tech. Um, they, they promoted their drugs with advertisements that said, I want to focus on my life, not my pain. So they implied that it improved function, though there was no data to support that. Freedom from pain, extra strength pain relief, free of extra prescribing restrictions. So we got a form of hydrocodone, Vicodin ES, that's easily prescribed. And then this one just burns my britches. You know, the Joint Commission came along with the fifth vital sign that said every treatment program that they certify has to check blood pressure, pulse, temperature, and respiratory rate, and then ask the patient what the pain score is. And what's the nurse going to do if he or she gets a response of eight? They're going to give medicine, which is ordered in the chart. So it was a systematic approach, nefarious. You know, th this, this is not about doctors doing the wrong thing and patients doing the wrong thing. This is about pharmaceutical manufacturers doing the wrong thing and the government allowing them to do it. The FDA allowed this. And as a result, prescription opioids have become harder and now heroin is, is, is out there. We, we all know this. And of the people that use heroin, 80% started with a prescription drug. And I want to tell you that the people that are admitted to our pain program are not in the group of patients that are using heroin. They are law-abiding, uh, you know, they're not uh, suffering from the kind of addiction that, that I had where anything goes. They are pursuing relief with opioids. They're not out there using illicit drugs most of the time. And the numbers are up. So there's three waves of this ep death epidemic. The first is the prescription opioids, uh, natural and semi-synthetic. So that's hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine, et cetera. That leveled off when he and heroin took off in 2014. And now we have this surge of synthetic opioid deaths, uh, 20, uh, almost 20,000 in 2016 and 30,000 in 2017. Now, I was, when I woke up this morning, I read an article, and I, I wrote it down because I wanted to be able to quote it to you. Basically, <coughs> this is fascinating. So in 2017, there were 70,000 drug overdose deaths in the United States, 20% from cocaine, another 10% from other psychostimulants, primarily methamphetamine. The deaths are related to the fentanyl that's in those drugs. So the new emergence is going to be, you know, as the opioids get more restricted, we're seeing these fentanyl supplements into stimulant drugs. So it, it looks to me like that's the next version. And, you know, rather than an opioid epidemic, we have an epidemic of addiction and drug use disorders with opioids being the drug du jour. And I think we're on the rise for stimulants. And I think we're on the rise for cannabinoids as well, marijuana. We can talk about that in the questions if you need to. <laughs> so what do we do about all this? Well, the government and the treatment industry seems to think that medication-assisted treatment is the answer, that it is treatment. And I have some dispute with that concept. Medications are helpful in stabilizing the patient and stabilizing the brain. The medications that we have available, of course, are methadone. Methadone's available in a clinic setting. You have to have a special license. The clinic has to dispense the methadone, uh, and it's in a, a, a dosed uh, variant. And most clinics have some sort of a counseling component, but really it's about methadone maintenance. And a lot of those clinics, anybody work in methadone? So I don't want to misspeak, but in many methadone clinics that I've witnessed, people drink alcohol, people smoke marijuana products, and people are using stimulants. So it's only the opioid that the methadone stabilizes. We do have data that says deaths go down, infectious diseases go down, and criminality goes down if people are maintained on methadone. So there's an appeal to that. Then along came this drug that doctors can prescribe in their office, and that's, of course, buprenorphine, suboxone, subsolve, big industry, billion, multi-billion dollar industry now. 
And its advantages are that unlike methadone and other opioids, it only partially stimulates the opioid receptor. As a result, it theoretically doesn't get people as high. We have a lot of people whose drug of choice is Suboxone. It's the one they, they like. So it is not across the board unable to get people high, but it is less likely to get people high and, than uh, uh, a full agonist opioid. The other problem with Suboxone, anybody ha know what the other problem is? It's hard to stop. It's really hard to stop. It binds very tightly to the receptor site. So no exit strategy. Here we are again. <laughs> you know, we got this, this treatment, which is saving lives and stabilizing brains and keeping people in the treatment setting. But what's the end? You know, is that, is, uh, you know, the, the, some of the people in the field say, well, it's like insulin. You know, you have diabetes, you take insulin for the rest of your life. Bam. What about diet? What about exercise? What about positive attitude? What about meditation? You know, it should be part of diabetes treatment. It certainly should be part of addiction treatment. Now, Trexone is a blocker of the opioid receptor. The advantage is that it's not an opioid, doesn't get people in any way intoxicated. The disadvantages are it's, uh, it, it can sensitize the receptor site. So if people are on naltrexone and then stop, they, are, they can be at risk of, a, of an easier uh, overdose uh, phenomenon. So uh, naltrexone comes in a pill form and in an injectable form. The injection is Vivitrol, and it blocks the receptor so that the person, if they're on naltrexone, pretty much can't get high. And then finally, naloxone or Narcan, is the overdose reversal drug. If somebody has had a respiratory or a cardiac arrest with an opioid overdose, giving them this drug either intranasally or injection will cause their heart to resume and their breathing to uh, come back. A couple of advantages are you got an alive person instead of a dead person. That's clearly an advantage. Disadvantage, it's not treatment. You know, we, we have reports of people who've had three or four arrests and injections and arrests and no, no treatment as associated with that. Uh, and furthermore, now the dose of naloxone that's available commercially does not respond to fentanyl overdose. It needs about three times the dose and people don't know that. So, you know, this is a pretty imperfect way to intervene. It's where it's state of the art and it is the, again, NIDA, uh, Dr. Volkow was at a talk at the American Society of Addiction Medicine. She said, medication is treatment. And I disagree. Medication is a reasonable part of treatment as long as we have an exit strategy or a strategy that, you know, you are so sick with your addiction that we're going to have to maintain you for the rest of your life. Have a, a straight up understanding with the patient, make sure the patient believes it, and, and that's you know, that's one way to go. I mean, if, if we're treating an 18-year-old who's been abusing oxys for three months, it seems kind of drastic to me. So that's my, that's my two cents about uh, medication-assisted treatment. What's the difference between being addicted to painkillers and just really, really liking them a lot? <laughs> you know? I actually had a patient who said, Doc, I don't have addiction. I have dyslexia. The bottle said one every four hours, and I took four every one hour. So... <laughs> The definition of addiction that I like the best is not in the DSM, but in the American Society of Addiction Medicine's website. And here it is. I mean, it's, it's a page long, but the part that's most important here is an individual pathologically pursuing reward and or relief by substance use and or behaviors. And it's pathological pursuit of relief that we see in the patients who are admitted to our pain program. They are not getting high. I mean, if you think about it, most addicts towards the end are not really getting very high. There's not a whole lot of fun, even, you know, maybe it's the first 10 minutes after the injection, but in a lot of patients, it's just diminishing withdrawal. So, um, but pathological is the key, and what's pathological? Continuing to do it despite consequences. I have a lot of patients who come in, take their drug as prescribed from the doctor, but their life is a mess. Their life is in the toilet. Their wife or husband is left. Uh, they are in bed. They're not working. They're not functioning. That's pathological. And they're still taking the drug. That's pathological pursuit. 
So the drug company, one of the other strategies was, we're going to pin it on the addicts, the drug abusers. You know, those bad drug abusers and the poor pain patient, you know, the grandmother who takes one hydrocodone so she can dance at her son's wedding. Honest to God, that was one of the ads they had. When in fact, that's a fake du uh, dichotomy. Thank you. <laughs> that aberrant drug use behaviors are common in pain patients. 63% of patients admitted to using opioids for purposes other than pain. 35% met the DSM-5 criteria for opiate use disorder, which is hard to do, right? Because you eliminate uh, tolerance and dependence. And then finally, 92% of people who overdosed and died on opioids had a prescription for opioids for chronic pain. So the overlap is substantial. In the last couple minutes, I just wanted to talk about some of the specific emotional uh, intensifiers and some of the interventions that we can use with those emotions. Uh, and, you know, the first one that comes up is guilt. Every, I've never met a patient who didn't feel like he or she was responsible for her pain condition or his pain condition. You know, call it false guilt. The Buddhists say pain is not a punishment, joy is not a reward, they're simply occurrences. But that's not how most of my patients approach their life. So feeling responsible and guilty is one of the big things that we need to deal with and, and dealing with the shame that underlies some of the identity issues. Anger and resentment, I mean, I've described a bunch of different patients' situations where anger has driven the pain up. Uh, dealing with resentments, uh, cultivated anger is, is essential for uh, recovery from pain uh, and uh, addiction. Loneliness is such an isolating condition. People are isolated from their supports. People, often patients will say to me, nobody wants to be with me. You know, I'm a drag. I don't want to be with me. So one of the things that happens in the treatment is the milieu starts to work. And people go to group, not with a group of people who say, you're full of crap, you're in denial, it's addiction, but with a bunch of people who say, yeah, I have pain. I've had 12 surgeries. How many have you had? You know, oh, gosh, I only had six. <laughs> you know, I want to sit next to you and hear how you did it. But identifying it diffuses that loneliness. The sense of helplessness, like there's nothing I can do, marches in the, in the face of that self-efficacy. We're doing a study right now, and we have a couple of scales of self-efficacy uh, with pain. And what we're finding is that the people who develop, you know, they come in victimized and uh, with an external locus of control, you fix me, I need the massage therapist, I need surgery. People who begin to internalize their locus of control and become more self-efficacious do much better. So we're developing more clinical techniques to give people a sense of, of being able to help themselves. And fear drives pain. I mean, there's just no question about it. There's been a description of fear avoidance syndrome. So fear avoidance looks like this. So I mentioned my back, right? And I mentioned my, did I mention my shoulder? Right? <laughs> Rotator cuff? Yeah, right? Yeah. The elbow too? Yeah, thanks. thanks. So, my shoulder hurts all the time. If I sleep on it, it hurts even more. If it hurts, it hurts when I move it, particularly through a range of motion. If it hurts here, and I don't move it anymore, what's going to happen? That's where it's going to stay. If I can't move it anymore, and it's stuck, then I can't get my jacket on. If I can't get my jacket on, I feel less well about myself, and I don't want to go anywhere. That's the fear avoidance cycle. Fear drives immobility. They call it kinesiophobia. It hurts, so don't, don't do that, you know? So what do we do about pain and fear? Well, cognitive behavioral therapy has vast amounts of data. People are familiar in this room, I believe, with CBT, but it's basically changing the way you think about the pain, challenging the cognitive distortions, and using a bunch of different techniques avoiding generalization and uh, reactivity. Catastrophization gets dealt with. Catastrophization, making things worse instead of better. Dialectical behavioral therapy has some good efficacy. Distress reduction combined with mindfulness practice, Marsha Lenahan, and I mentioned ACT, uh, that was Stephen Hayes at the University of Nevada, Reno. Being distracted from pain causes the pain to go down. Everybody knows that, right? I actually had a patient who had cervical stenosis, neck 
compression. And he also had some lightheadedness. He was 72 years old. We detox him. He's doing really well. They were in group, and they did the serenity prayer, held hands, and he got real dizzy and fell down. And he kicked the chair and dislocated the first three toes of his right foot. Very painful. So we called an ambulance and sent him over to the ER to see an orthopedist, but I got there just around the time he was waiting for the ambulance, screaming, Doc, Doc, my toes. I said, well, how's your neck? He said, my neck, but my neck. My neck is fine. I said, oh, really? Well, you came here for neck pain, not toe pain, so it looks like we've done our job. <laughs> the truth is, I don't feel my pain when I'm working until I talk about it. <laughs> But when I'm, when I'm running, I don't feel my pain. And now that I'm talking about it, it tightens up. And control, we talked about placebo. Having a sense of control has been studied very well. More internalized control, better experience of pain. And fear reduction. So what do I do about this poor shoulder of mine? Well, like it or not, I went to yoga, and one of the exercises was moving through the range of motion. And as a result of that, Every morning I do this, and it does, you know, I mean, I, you can see it, it hurts right there. It does. <laughs> but I have full mobility, improved function, and I have less pain as a result of it. Not no pain. You know, this is not a no pain formula. People don't walk out pain free, mostly. But they walk out with a whole lot less pain and a whole lot more function. Three pearls about pain. Conditioning increases pain. Uh, the classic study was of a solicitous spouse. So we studied a patient who had chronic back pain, males, and in that uh, setting, they would give him electric shock in his back, and he would jolt like that. In the presence of this, and then they measure his pain score and they measure his brain activity that showed pain response. In the presence of the spouse, double the pain score. Just having somebody there who says, oh, baby, oh, sweetheart. The, the empathetic, nice way to be. Not the way you're, I, not, it's not your way, right? <laughs> I know about it. So pain patients are a pain, would you agree? You see somebody in pain and you hurt. How many people feel that? Well, I wish there was more of you because that's empathy. <laughs> we have mirror neurons. We have neurons inside our brain that reflect your brain. And when you have a part of your brain that lights up in pain, my brain lights up in pain. Imagine what that's like for a spouse. Imagine what's that li that, what that's like for a doctor, for a therapist. And what we do is one of two things. We feel the pain and we push away, just like our patients do. We resist. We tighten up. We deny. And what's really important is to just, I mean, the most important thing that I do clinically is I sit with that patient until he or she is done talking. Really listen. It's a very powerful clinical tool and something they're not used to. Secondary gain prevents getting well. So there are benefits, and I do an exercise at the center and I say, tell me how your pain benefits you. Imagine what they say. Yeah, 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 yeah. what are you talking about? You're crazy. Or I say, tell me why you're holding on to your pain. And then somebody will say, well, it's my identity. I don't know who I would be without my pain. It gets me a lot of attention, somebody else will say. It makes me get a disability check so I don't have to work. And it enables me to get as many drugs as I want. And then we're off and running. So it's not like, remember, it's not you know, they sit at home plotting how to get more drugs and more attention. It's I have pain, I get more attention, and my brain conditions to that response. That's secondary gain, subconscious. CDC recommends that alone or combined with opioids, we should use non-opioid medication. So I've already talked about the NSAIDs, the TCAs, the SNRIs, the anticonvulsants, and the topicals. Physical treatment, I've talked a little bit about exercise, but motion is lotion. Getting the joints moving causes an increase in circulation and flow, uh, an improvement in uh, oxygenation, a, a elimination of toxins that accumulate, and a loosening up of fibrous tissue. So all beneficial for, for movement, but it should be proper movement. Weight loss in somebody who's overweight is very essential, especially for the stabilizing kinds of pains, back uh, and neck. 
behavioral treatments we've covered, CBT, DBT, ACT, and mindfulness. Uh, I've alluded to it a few times. John Kabat-Zinn is sort of the master of mindfulness. He wrote the book Full Catastrophe Living. So after you buy The Pain Antidote, that's my book, you should look, check out uh, John Kabat-Zinn's Full Catastrophe Living. In all seriousness, he has a CD that is the best I've ever heard, and it's pain and mindfulness. John Kabat-Zinn, Z-I-N-N, -N, you know, 10, 15 bucks. And he has a meditation in there that really walks you through, what if you can't meditate because the pain's too great? And then it's just really sort of isolating the edges of the pain in a very delicate way. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. And it's, it's about changing your thoughts. And when I was talking with somebody at the break, when we practice mindfulness, our brain changes. We, we make new connections between nerve cells. So I can't, the data is very supportive of changes in lots of different parts of the brain, changes in pain experience, uh, pain responsivity that show that everybody who has chronic pain ought to practice mindfulness. Uh, and finally, don't forget to talk to your patients and believe them. So at LVRC, we have a physical therapy program, uh, chiropractic treatments. There is some efficacy in chiropractor, particularly for neck and back conditions. Therapeutic massage, there's a benefit of being touched, but there's also loosening up of tight uh, tissue. Not a sustained benefit necessarily, but an improvement in function. We have a Reiki master who comes around, and uh, she's quite amazing. You know, if you're familiar with Reiki, it's energy work, working with uh, transmission in the, the chakras or the the conduits in the body with non-touch typically healing and uh, you know she's pretty blessed and <laughs> I had a guy from New Hampshire who's 72 he's like I ain't doing any of that reeky crap and I want to go to physical therapy I said well just go once you know try it out well he saw his aura and it was purple and he got off on Reiki and his pain went, it was zero he walked out of the building a zero and he now goes through a snowstorm an hour and a half to Boston to go see a Reiki master. So you never know what's gonna work. <laughs> acupuncture has efficacy compared to sham uh, acupuncture uh, uh, interventions. Works, you know, all of these things, the principle is some of these things work for some people some of the time. And sometimes they work for a while and then they stop working. So flexibility in using different tools is very indicated. Nutrition, very important. Certainly hydration, the number one inflammatory food is sugar. I resist going to that table twice today already. I hope I don't have cake before I leave because I feel better when I don't eat sugar. Uh, there are inflammatory foods to avoid, uh, particular uh, nightshade vegetables. Tomatoes seem to be inflammatory. Omega-6 uh, and, and charred foods, so barbecue unfortunately is not recommended. And then there are foods that diminish pain. The powerhouse vegetables, uh, Certain fruits, tart cherries, black, uh, blueberries, uh, strawberries, all diminish pain. Turmeric, uh, there's, a, there's a whole list of things uh, that you can find that are pretty readily available for nutrition. And I should mention one of the worst toxins that people ingest is nicotine. We, have a, we are not a smoke-free campus and we have a hard time encouraging people to quit smoking, uh, but it is causes increase in 20% in pain level. So it's something to, to campaign for. Uh, being with a group and working on issues is really key, it, both individually and, and group therapy. And then I mentioned mindfulness-based stress reduction. That's John Kabat-Zinn that I uh, referred to. And then yoga and Qigong, uh, movement with mindfulness co combined, very effective. There's a lot of varieties. There's uh, restorative yoga and there's uh, Vipassana and all, all the rest of it. Um, and you may know this, but actually drugs give the same benefits as yoga. Did, did you know that? I'll show you the example. This is a halasana pose for back pain uh, and insomnia, and you can see the drug effect on the right uh, is pretty good. <laughs> Child's pose, I, uh, he can't get his hips down. I have the same problem, uh, very tight hips. And then uh, savasana, oh, I, wrong button. Savasana, that corpse pose, he's got down 100%. That is my favorite yoga pose as well. So we have some time for questions. There's a microphone, so I just suggest- Raise your hand. I, I, I'll raise start. Oop, quick comment, and, and you can add to it. You mentioned the, uh, your dentist or the dentist who prescribes the Percocets and so on. Just as a, you know, we have an adolescent treatment program, and 
most people don't you know, take one or no, none of those pills, but put them in their medicine cabinet, and then their adolescent yeah. takes them, or their adolescent's friend comes to the bathroom and takes them, and it's a number one source of uh, yes. you know, medication. I, I, you know, we get those prescriptions, and we say, I'll just put them away in case I ever need them, and they sit there in your medicine cabinet. Do you know what, what happens in Vegas is the addicts go through the open houses in the realty section, and they want to be first at the open house to check the medicine cabinet. So, uh, the, the disposal programs that are instituted uh, nationally, take back days, are all about getting rid of those scripts. You can put the pills in, in coffee grounds and inactivate them. Not a great idea to flush them because it gets into the water supply, but better to flush them than to leave them in your medicine Question cabinet. here? Yes. Hi. Uh, I go back a long way. I, I actually. My first job out of medical school was as a medical director for uh, a drug abuse clinic in um, Long Beach. This was in the 1970s. And uh, the hot thing then was that Consumer Reports put out a monograph on controlled pain. And they, they discovered this medication called methadone, which they thought was really good. And it's a compelling, really compelling, uh, it's worth, worth getting and taking a look at it. Uh, because that really hasn't changed very much over time. Yes. Uh, two other quick question, uh, comments. Uh, I'm, I'm in primary care. I've been practicing in the community for a long time. And one of the things that worries me a lot is that, that uh, surgeons frequently will provide, uh, you know, 10 days course, but of course, oxycodone for a relatively minor orthopedic thing, because it's like not their problem. And then, of course, they run out, people still have pain, and so I have to tell people sure. why they don't have to do it. But if we could maybe work on our, on our uh, orthopedists to be appropriate with yes. the amount of med pain medicine they give, but it, it, it's sort of willy-nilly that they do that. I just mentioned Well, that. and I, the, the, the efforts, certainly the CDC efforts, and there's been three or four articles recently on post-surgical <coughs> pain. Right. There, there's actually a, an interesting uh, concept, which is not every surgery requires the same number of pills. So let's tabulate a hip versus uh, an ankle versus a, a digit, you know, and prescribe less for the less severe pain I conditions. I think that would work. I think yes. these guys are It's coming. Wise. I think because of the attention to the overdose epidemic, right. we've done some, as I said, some irrational things. We've cut people off. Uh, but that's a doctor response to the CDC recommendations that I shared with you. Right. What needs to happen is a smart, studied approach from a physician who says, it looks like this medicine isn't doing very good for your function. Let's see what we can do to help you. Exactly. And one last thing. This happened in this community uh, up in Palos Verdes. I was on call on the uh, 4th of July, and they brought a kid in, a um, 16-year-old kid. who had been at a party the night before. And what happened is a bunch of kids got together at a home when the parents weren't home, and everyone was told to bring some pain or some sort of sure. pain medication from their, from their parents' uh, uh, home, and, and they put all of it into a bowl, yeah. and then the, the game was to figure out, was to see who was chicken, how, how many of these unknown yeah. medications people could take without passing out. Those were called farm parties, P-H-A-R-M. You know, I'm, I'm interested that they're still going on, but uh, right. yeah. And so this, this kid uh, um, actually, a lot of people gave up their fourth to save this kid, because he got, the, the, what happened Overdose. was he walked in, in, out in the street, got hit by a car, and had seven rib fractures, and <coughs> brain contusion, and all this kind of stuff, but if someone had only, yeah. parents, yeah. only really watched what their kids were doing you bet. with pain medications in their own home, that could have been prevented, and I, I suspect that's just in one anecdote, and there are millions yes, more. I agree with you. Thank you. Um, you were going to talk about CBD and cannabinoids, and I'm wondering what your take on that is. I told you not to ask me that during the break. Oh, no, I asked. After no, the I presentation. I told you. So <laughs> there, a, a couple of things. So there is no such thing as medical marijuana. Marijuana is not medication. We legislated that we can call it medication and sell it in dispensaries administered by bud tenders who are kids you know, with six days of training. But it's not medicine. It's not controlled the way medication is. Unfortunately, and this is the fault of the government, we didn't study cannabinoids well enough. 
you know, we made them illegal and nobody really studied them except there was one hospital in Mississippi that had a license to study them. So we have very little data about the efficacy. The plant has 140 different chemicals, the, the marijuana plant. The two that we know most about are THC, which is intoxicating, and as you know, in the THC or, or in the marijuana available now, THC levels have gone up astronomically. I mean, marijuana was my drug of choice. If I was out there today, I wouldn't be anywhere. I would be gone. So that's THC. CBD, cannabidiol, is the medical component that we know most about. And CBD comes in oils and uh, pills and uh, solutions and uh, salves and you know all sorts of forms. We haven't studied it well enough to convince me of its efficacy. That isn't to say it's not efficacious. People use it and it helps. That's called anecdote. You know, I think it was you at the break who said, you know, maybe it's just placebo. I don't care if there's no harm proven and it looks like CBD is a safe, non-addicting substance, so knock yourself out. What I will tell you is that we just saw an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association that said 60% of CBD preparations had more THC than they were labeled. So the accuracy of what people are saying is pure CBD is not reliable. So that's one caution. You're buying it on the internet. There's a hemp product. CBD comes from the hemp seed, which is different than marijuana CBD, and that seems to be more beneficial. I think over time we will see more and more studies, but marijuana is a big, big industry. The, the messages that we're getting are provided by very sophisticated marketing companies who have very high profit margins, and that makes me very nervous. The one fact about marijuana that makes me highly opposed to any legalized form is that use in adolescence is directly related to perception of risk. Low perception of risk, higher use. So what legalization and medicalization of this product has done is made adolescents more likely to use marijuana, and that is a disaster. You know, it's a toxic substance to adolescent brains unquestionably. Thanks for the question. Okay. As per our, when I caught you at the break and I started to ask you about the intense pain that can come with Lyme, chronic Lyme <sighs> disease and its co-infections, what are your thoughts about helping those folks with their pain and lack of functionality? With? with when they have Lyme disease, so in this case chronic. Yes, so but you're talking specifically about CBD or about any? No, about any. Yeah. So I, I got a few questions at the break. One was on Lyme disease. One was on chronic regional pain syndrome, which used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy. It's basically a limb starts to be painful, typically a limb for no good reason, and it becomes excruciatingly painful, and there can be sympathetic nervous system uh, changes, and it can actually spread from one limb to another into different parts of the body. Unexplained pain syndromes, essentially. You know, probably a, a tick born uh, infection with Lyme disease. We don't know what uh, CRPS is. They are forms of central sensitization that I talked about. You know, the etiology is gonna be related to whatever the etiology is, you know, whether it's injury. My belief, my understanding of these conditions is it's the sensitization of the nervous system that's turned up and my recommendations for people with those conditions is to take them very seriously and to do all the things that I've been talking about, you know, which is learn a mindfulness practice. You know, it is not sufficient to say, I tried meditating and I can't sit still, my mind's too busy. That's just not acceptable if you want to go to, you know, in AA we say you go to any lengths. Half measures availed us nothing. Geez, I used to think half measures would avail me half and that's all I needed because I wasn't that bad. <laughs> so it really is a, a concerted approach that involves mind and body and spirit that I think is going to be a, a facilitative benefit to anybody with any of these central pain syndromes. It's a hard sell. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of diligence. But it changes people's lives. And exercise and movement has to be a part of all that. Thanks. More Anyone questions? 
Okay. No? All right. I, I'm gonna, Thank you very much. Oh, hey, don't leave. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't leave. I want to just uh, end with a, a couple of comments. One is that Voltaire, was around the 1970s, he said, doctors are men who prescribe medicines of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less in human beings of whom they know nothing. <laughs> My doctor crowds don't like that one either. He also said, the art of medicine consists of amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. So, you know, one of the principles in recovery is not taking ourselves too seriously. What I can tell you is that this c combination of illnesses, chronic pain and substance use, is disastrous, devastating. You know, people come in debilitated, uh, uh, dysfunctional, depressed, and what we see is that when we remove the opioid and then we start teaching people some of the principles of becoming self-efficacious, they change. You know, just like addiction patients change. You know, we go from that spot to bright eyes and motivated and optimistic, and I've seen it happen. It's as close as a miracle as I've ever seen in my clinical career. But in terms of the key points, remember the pain is real. Emotions drive the experience of chronic pain. Opioids make the pain worse often. Treat to improve function and expectations influence outcome. So if you came in thinking you were gonna have a good morning, you probably had a way better morning than if you came in thinking, who is this guy, when can I leave? Um, <laughs> so this woman took her husband to the doctor, said the doctor said, your husband's suffering from a severe stress disorder. He has anxiety, he has depression, he has pain, and he has addiction. But if you do the following, he's going to regain his health completely. Take him to the doctor, take him to the gym, feed him three good meals, nutritious lunch, candlelight dinner every once in a while, make sure he doesn't take the wrong medicine or drink, make sure he takes the right medicine, and have sex with him once a week. If you do all that, he's going to regain his health completely. What did the doctor say? You're going to die. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.